Hello, second grade, and welcome back to our YouTube channel. Today we're going to be reading chapters 13 and 14 of Charlotte's Web, and we're also going to be talking about some of the questions or like concepts that we find in chapters 13 and 14 that are going to be on the pages that you're working on today. So here's my book. Hopefully you're following along with me in your copy of the book. Remember that actually looking at the words and reading them with me is what's going to make you a better reader. All right, chapter 13 starts on page 92. Now, the last time I read with you, we talked a little bit about Roman numerals, and that's a different type of numbering system that actually uses letters to represent numbers. So here on page 92, again, this is chapter 13. Last time we talked about how the letter V means five, and the letter I means one. Well, the letter X actually means 10. So X stands for 10, and remember I still stands for one. So here we have 10, one, one, one. So 10 plus one plus one plus one makes 13. <clears throat> so this is chapter 13, and it's called Good Progress. Far into the night, while the other creatures slept, Charlotte worked on her web. First, she ripped out a few of the orb lines near the center. She left the radial ones, those are the ones that go straight across, as they were needed for support. As she worked, her eight legs were a great help to her. So were her teeth. She loved to weave and she was an expert at it. When she was finished ripping things out, her web looked something like this. So when it says she was ripping out the orb lines, those are kind of the circle lines. It says the radial lines, the ones that go straight across, are the ones that she kept for support. They're kind of like support beams, like if you were building a house or something. A spider can produce several kinds of thread. She uses a dry, tough thread for foundation lines, and she uses a sticky thread for snare lines, the ones that catch and hold insects. Charlotte decided to use her dry thread for writing the new message. If I write the word terrific with sticky thread, she thought, Every bug that comes along will get stuck in it and spoil the effect. Now let's see. The first letter is T. Charlotte climbed to a point at the top of the left-hand side of the web. Swinging her spinnerets into position, she attached her thread and then dropped down. As she dropped, her spinning tubes went into action and she let out the thread. At the bottom, she attached the thread. This formed the upright part of the letter T. Charlotte was not satisfied, however. She climbed up and made another attachment right next to the first. Then she carried the line down so that she had a double line instead of a single line. It will show up better if I make the whole thing with double lines. She climbed back up, moved over about an inch to the left, touched her spinnerets to the web, and then carried a line across to the front, forming the top of the T. She repeated this, making it double. Her eight legs were very busy helping. Now for the E. Charlotte got so interested in her work, she began to talk to herself as though to cheer herself on. If you had been sitting quietly in the barn cellar that evening, you would have heard something like this. Now for the R. Up we go. Attach. Descend. Pay outline. Whoa. Attach. Good. Up you go. Repeat. Attach. Descend. Pay outline. Whoa, girl. Steady now. Attach. Climb. Attach. Over to the right, pay out line, attach. Now right and down and swing that loop and around and around. Now into the left, attach, climb, repeat, okay. Easy, keep those lines together. Now then, out and down for the leg of the R. Pay out line, whoa, attach, ascend, repeat, good girl. And so, talking to herself, the spider worked at her difficult task. When it was completed, she felt hungry. She ate a small bug that she had been saving, and then she slept. Next morning, Wilbur arose and stood beneath the web. He breathed the morning air into his lungs. Drops of dew catching the sun made the web stand out clearly. When Lurvie arrived with breakfast, there was the handsome pig, and over him, woven neatly in block letters, was the word, terrific, another miracle. Here's what it looks like. There's Wilbur standing next to the web here. It says terrific. It's a lot of hard work for a spider. Charlotte is a very hardworking 
spider. She spent the whole night when all the other animals were asleep working on this. So that's, that's a good friend right there. Working on something all night long for her friend. Lurvy rushed and called Mr. Zuckerman. Mr. Zuckerman rushed and called Mrs. Zuckerman. Mrs. Zuckerman ran to the phone and called the Arables, and the Arables climbed into their truck and hurried over. Everybody stood at the pig pen and stared at the web and read the word over and over while Wilbur, who really felt terrific, stood quietly swelling out his chest and swinging his snout from side to side because he's very proud. Terrific, breathed Zufferman in joyful admiration. Edith, you better phone the reporter on the Weekly Chronicle and tell him about this. That's the newspaper. He may want to bring a photographer. There isn't a pig in the whole state that is as terrific as our pig. The news spread. People who had journeyed to see Wilbur when he was some pig came back again to see him now that he was terrific. That afternoon when Mr. Zuckerman went to milk the cows and clean out the tie-ups, he was still thinking about what a wondrous pig he owned. Lurvy, he called. There is to be no more cow manure throw down into that pig pen, so no more cow poop. I have a terrific pig. I want that pig to have clean, bright straw every day for his bedding. Understand? Yes, sir, said Lurvy. Furthermore, said Mr. Zuckerman, I want you to start building a crate for Wilbur. I have decided to take the pig to the county fair on September 6th. Make the crate large and paint it green with gold letters. What will the letters say? asked Lurvy. They should say Zuckerman's famous pig. Lurvy picked up a pitchfork and walked away to get some clean straw. Having such an important pig was going to mean plenty of extra work. He could see that. Below the apple orchard at the end of the path was the dump where Mr. Zuckerman threw all sorts of trash and stuff that nobody wanted anymore. Here, in a small clearing hidden by young alders and wild raspberry bushes, was an astounding pile of old bottles and empty tin cans and dirty rags and bits of metal and broken bottles and broken hinges and broken springs and dead batteries and last month's magazines and old discarded dish mops and tattered overalls and rusty spikes and leaky pails and forgotten stoppers and useless junk of all kinds, including a wrong size crank for a broken ice cream freezer. So it's a garbage dump that's at the end of the path by the apple orchard. Templeton knew the dump and liked it. There were good hiding places there, excellent cover for a rat, and there was usually a tin can with food still clinging to the inside. Templeton was down there now rummaging around. When he returned to the barn, he carried in his mouth an advertisement he had torn from a crumpled magazine. How's this? he asked, showing the ad to Charlotte. It says crunchy. Crunchy would be a good word to write in your web. Just the wrong idea, replied Charlotte. It couldn't be worse. We don't want Zuckerman to think Wilbur's crunchy. He might start thinking about crisp, crunchy bacon and tasty ham. That would put ideas into his head. We must advertise Wilbur's noble qualities, not his tastiness. Go get another word, please, Templeton. So here's Templeton bringing the like wrappers with the words on it to Charlotte. We're on page 98, by the way, at the bottom. The rat looked disgusted, so he doesn't want to go do more favors for Charlotte and find another word. But he sneaked away to the dump and was back in a while with a strip of cotton cloth. How's this? He asked. It's a label off an old shirt. Charlotte examined the label. It said pre-shrunk. <laughs> I'm sorry, Templeton, she said, but pre-shrunk is out of the question. We want Zuckerman to think Wilbur is nicely filled out, not all shrunk up. I'll have to ask you to try again. What do you think I am, a messenger boy? Grumbled the rat. I'm not going to spend all my time chasing down to the dump after advertising material. Just once more, please, said Charlotte. I'll tell you what I'll do, said Templeton. I know where there's a package of soap flakes in the woodshed. It has writing on it. I'll bring you a piece of the package. He climbed the rope that hung on the wall and disappeared through a hole in the ceiling. When he came back, he had a strip of blue and white cardboard in his teeth. There, he said triumphantly. How's that? Charlotte read the word. 
with new radiant action. What does it mean? asked Charlotte, who had never used any soap flakes in her life. How should I know? said Templeton. You asked for words and I brought them. I suppose the next thing you'll want me to fetch is a dictionary. Together they studied the soap ad. With new radiant action, repeated Charlotte slowly. Wilbur, she called. Wilbur, who was asleep in the straw, jumped up. Run around, commanded Charlotte. I want to see you in action to see if you are radiant. Wilbur raced to the end of his yard. Now back again faster, said Charlotte. Wilbur galloped back. His skin shone. His tail had a fine, tight curl in it. Jump into the air, cried Charlotte. Wilbur jumped as high as he could. Keep your knees straight and touch the ground with your ears, called Charlotte. Wilbur obeyed. Do a backflip with a half twist in it, cried Charlotte. Wilbur went over backwards, writhing and twisting as he went. So here's Wilbur trying to do a backflip, I suppose. Okay, Wilbur, said Charlotte. You can go back to sleep. Okay, Templeton, the soap ad will do, I guess. I'm not sure Wilbur's action is exactly radiant, but it's interesting. Actually, said Wilbur, I feel radiant. Do you? said Charlotte, looking at him with affection. Well, you're a good little pig and radiant you shall be. I'm in this thing pretty deep now. I might as well go the limit. Tired from his rump, that means kind of running around, Wilbur lay down in the clean straw. He closed his eyes. The straw seemed scratchy, not as comfortable as the cow manure, which was always delightfully soft to lie in. So even though the cow manure, the cow poop, is kind of like gross and smelly because it's poop, Wilbur kind of likes it better than the straw because it's more comfortable. If you've ever been to a farm or on a hayride and felt the straw, it's pretty kind of scratchy, itchy stuff. So Wilbur's kind of like, mm, this isn't as comfy. So he pushed the straw to one side and stretched out in the manure. Wilbur sighed. It had been a busy day, his first day of being terrific. Dozens of people had visited his yard during the afternoon, and he had to stand and pose looking as terrific as he could. Now he was tired. Fern had arrived and seated herself quietly on her stool in the corner. Tell me a story, Charlotte, said Wilbur as he lay waiting for sleep to come. Tell me a story. So Charlotte, although she too was tired, remember she was up all night making that web. She did what Wilbur wanted. <clears throat> Once upon a time, she began, I had a beautiful cousin who managed to build her web across a small stream. One day a tiny fish leaped into the air and got tangled in the web. My cousin was very much surprised, of course. The fish was thrashing wildly. My cousin hardly dared tackle it, but she did. She swooped down and threw great masses of wrapping material around the fish and fought bravely to capture it. Did she succeed? asked Wilbur. It was a never to be forgotten battle, said Charlotte. There was the fish caught only by one fin and its tail wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. And there was the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish. Here's a picture of that happening. Wilbur's or I'm sorry, Charlotte's cousin with her web and the fish stuck inside. How much did the fish weigh? Asked Wilbur eagerly. I don't know, said Charlotte. There was my cousin slipping in, dodging out, beaten mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing fish, dancing in, dancing out, throwing her, head, her threads and fighting hard. First she threw a left around the tail. The fish lashed back, then a left to the tail and a right to the midsection. The fish lashed back. Then she dodged to one side and threw a right and another right to the fin. Then a hard left to the head while the web swayed and stretched. Then what happened, said Wilbur. Well, nothing, said Charlotte. The fish lost the fight. My cousin wrapped it up so tight it couldn't budge. Then what happened, asked Wilbur. Nothing, said Charlotte. My cousin kept the fish for a while, and then, when she got good and ready, she ate it. Tell me another story, begged Wilbur. So Charlotte told him about another cousin of hers who was an aeronaut. What is an aeronaut? asked Wilbur. A balloonist, 
said Charlotte. My cousin used to stand on her head and let out enough thread to form a balloon. Then she'd let go and be lifted into the air and carried upward on the warm wind. Is that true? asked Wilbur. Or are you just making it up? It's true, replied Charlotte. I have some very remarkable cousins. And now, Wilbur, it's time you went to sleep. Sing something, begged Wilbur, closing his eyes. So Charlotte sang a lullaby while crickets chirped in the grass and the barn grew dark, and this was the song she sang. The warns are, Sleep, sleep, my love, my only, Deep, deep in the dung and the dark. Be not afraid and be not lonely. This is the hour when frogs and thrushes Praise the world from the woods and the rushes. Rest, rest from care, my one and only, Deep in the dung and the dark. But Wilbur was already asleep, and when the song ended, Fern got up and went home. All right, before we move on to chapter 14, let's talk about what kind of happened in chapter 13. So in chapter 13, we started off with Charlotte making a new web, and it said, terrific. Um, and let's see. They were super excited about that. People came over to see. Uh, Mr. Zuckerman thought they should call the newspaper, and now he's planning to take Wilbur somewhere. Do you remember where? He's going to be taking him to the fair. So we're going to read more about that as we continue on with the book. Um, let's see what else. So Charlotte had asked Templeton the rat to find some new words that she could write into the web about Wilbur. So Templeton decided to look in the trash dump. Now there was a whole big paragraph on page 97 that talked about what's in the trash dump. One of the things in the worksheets that you're going to be working on today is asking about words and things to describe the trash dump. So you'll be able to find that on page 97. So that'll help you out. So um, Templeton likes the dump for a couple of reasons. Mentions that towards the bottom of the page said Templeton knew the dump and liked it. There were good hiding places there, and there was usually a tin can with food still clinging to the inside. So he liked the dump because it has good hiding places, and it usually has a little bit of food left over. All right, so what word did they find to describe Wilbur? Do you remember? They were going to use crunchy, but Charlotte said, no, that's gonna make him think of bacon. Then he went and found the word sh um, pre-shrunk. And she's like, no, we don't want them to think Wilbur shrunk. So they decided to use the word radiant. What does radiant mean? Does anybody know? Think about it. Radiant kind of means like clean and bright and looking very nice. So she's having him kind of jump around and do tricks to see if he's radiant, kind of clean and bright and well prepared. They use, remember, Templeton got that word from a thing of laundry detergent. And the full phrase is with new radiant action. So if you are thinking about your clothes being radiant, you would want your clothes when they come out of the washer. So like think, if you put dirty clothes into the washing machine and they're coming out radiant, you want them like clean, not stained, no more dirt, smelling fresh, looking really bright and nice colors, super clean. So that's kind of what we're thinking about Wilbur, but he's a pig, so he's not exactly radiant, right? Because pigs, he literally lays in poop all day. He lays in manure. But it kind of means like bright and clean and ready to go and shiny and full of color. And so she's kind of making him jump around to see if he's fresh and things like that. But Wilbur says he feels radiant, so that's good. All right, and at the end, Charlotte tells a story about her cousins, and they go to sleep. So that's what happened in chapter 13. Now we're going to read chapter 14, and it's called Dr. Dorian. We talked a little about a little bit about Dr. Dorian in... Uh, either chapter 7 or 8, one of the chapters that I read with you last time we read together. Now here's something a little interesting about um, Roman numerals. So here we have the X that means 10, and then we have a 1 
but the one or the I is coming before a five. So that means one less than five. Well, think about math. What's one less than five? Four. So when you have an I or a one before a five, that means one less than. So we have 10, one less than five. Well, we just mentioned that one less than five is four. So 10 and four means chapter 14. So Roman numerals are a little bit tricky, but I hope you're kind of enjoying this little mini lesson on Roman numerals. All right, so Dr. Dorian. Now, if you remember from before, Dr. Dorian is Fern's doctor. And way back in chapter eight, um, Mrs. Arable, Fern's mom, was wanting to talk to Dr. Dorian about Fern always spending time with the animals and saying that she thinks the animals are talking. And Mrs. Arable was pretty worried about Fern because of this. So it sounds like maybe she's going to talk to Dr. Dorian in this chapter. What do you think? All right, let's get reading. This is on page 105. The next day was Saturday. Fern stood at the kitchen sink, drying the breakfast dishes as her mother washed them. Mrs. Arable worked silently. She hoped Fern would go out and play with other children instead of heading for the Zuckerman's barn to sit and watch animals. Charlotte is the best storyteller I ever heard, said Fern, poking her dish towel into a cereal bowl. Fern, said her mother sternly, you must not invent things. You know spiders don't tell stories. Spiders can't talk. Charlotte can replied Fern. She doesn't talk very loud, but she talks. What kind of story did she tell? asked Mrs. Arable. Well, began Fern, she told us about a cousin of hers who thought who caught a fish in her web. Don't you think that's fascinating? Fern, dear, how would a fish get in a spider's web? said Mrs. Arable. You know it couldn't happen. You're making this up. Oh, it happened all right, replied Fern. Charlotte never fibs. Fibs is another word for it, lies, so Charlotte never lies. This cousin of hers built a web across a stream. One day she was hanging around on the web and a tiny fish leaped into the air and got tangled in the web. The fish was caught by one fin mother. Its tail was wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. Can't you just see the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish? Charlotte's cousin kept slipping in, dodging out, and she was beaten mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing fish dancing in, dancing out, throwing fern, snapped her mother. Ooh, so her mom kind of yelled. Stop it, stop inventing these wild tales. I'm not inventing, said Fern. I'm just telling you the facts. So what they mean by the word inventing here is making things up. So her mom's like, stop making up these crazy stories. And Fern's saying, I'm not making them up. I'm telling you what really happened, the facts. Well, what finally happened? Asked her mother, whose curiosity began to get the better of her. Charlotte's cousin won. She wrapped the fish up and then she ate him when she got good and ready. Spiders have to eat the same as the rest of us. Yes, I suppose they do, said Mrs. Arable, vaguely. Charlotte has another cousin who's a balloonist. She stands on her head, lets out a lot of line, and is carried aloft, or away, on the wind. Mother, wouldn't you simply love to do that? Yes, I would come to think of it, replied Mrs. Arable. But Fern, darling, I wish you would play outdoors today instead of going to Uncle Homer's barn. Find some of your playmates and do something nice outdoors. You're spending too much time in that barn. It isn't good for you to be alone so much. Alone, said Fern. Alone? My best friends are in the barn cellar. It is a very sociable place. Not at all lonely. So she's saying like, all the animals talk all the time. I'm not alone and I'm not lonely there. Fern disappeared after a while, walking down the road towards Zuckerman's. Her mother dusted the sitting room. As she worked, she kept thinking about Fern. It didn't seem natural for a little girl to be so interested in animals. Finally, Mrs. Arable made up her mind. She would pay a call on old Dr. Dorian and ask his advice. She got in the car and drove to his office in the village. Dr. Dorian had a thick beard. He was glad to see Mrs. Arable and gave her a comfortable chair. It's about Fern, she explained. Fern spends entirely too much time in the Zuckerman's barn. 
It doesn't seem normal. She sits on a milk stool in a corner of a barn cellar near the pig pen and watches animals hour after hour. She just sits and listens. Dr. Dorian leaned back and closed his eyes. How enchanting, he said. It must be real nice and quiet down there. Homer has some sheep, hasn't he? Yes, said Mrs. Arable, but it all started with that pig we let burn raise on a bottle. She calls him Wilbur. Homer bought the pig, and ever since it left our place, Fern has been going to her uncle's to be near it. I've been hearing things about that pig, said Dr. Dorian, opening his eyes. They say he's quite a pig. Have you heard about the words that appeared in the spider's web? asked Mrs. Arable nervously. Yes, replied the doctor. Well, do you understand it? asked Mrs. Arable. Understand what? Do you understand how there could be any writing in a spider's web? Oh, no, said Dr. Dorian. I don't understand it. But for that matter, I don't understand how a spider learned to spin a web in the first place. When the word appeared, everyone said they were a miracle, but nobody pointed out that the web itself is a miracle. What's miraculous about a spider's web? said Mrs. Arable. I don't see why you say a web is a miracle. It's just a web. Ever try to spin one? asked Dr. Dorian. Mrs. Arable shifted uneasily in her chair. No, she replied, but I can crochet a doily and I can knit a sock. Sure, said the doctor, but somebody taught you, didn't they? Here's Mrs. Arable and Dr. Dorian talking. So the doctor's saying, like, it's a miracle that spiders can spin webs. If you think about it, how do they know how to do that? It's super cool that they just, like, move around and spin, shooting, like, literally like a string out of their bottoms. And they're able to build these really cool webs. They look so fragile and delicate. And so he's like, that's a miracle. And she's kind of like, well, I know how to knit. <laughs> if you think about knitting needles with yarn and stuff. And he's like, yeah, but somebody taught you how to do that. Yes, my mother taught me, said Mrs. Arable. We're on page 110. Well, who taught a spider? A young spider knows how to spin a web without any instructions from anybody. Don't you regard that as a miracle? I suppose so, said Mrs. Arable. I never looked at it that way before. Still, I don't understand how those words got into the web. I don't understand it, and I don't like what I can't understand. None of us do, said Dr. Dorian, sighing. I'm a doctor. Doctors are supposed to understand everything, but I don't understand everything, and I don't intend to let it worry me. Mrs. Arable fidgeted. I Means she kind of... Mm. Fern says the animals talk to each other. Dr. Dorian, do you believe animals talk? I've never heard one say anything, he replied, but that proves nothing. It is quite possible that an animal has spoken civilly to me, and I didn't catch the remark because I wasn't paying attention. Children pay better attention than grown-ups. If Fern says the animals in Zuckerman's barn talk, I'm quite ready to believe her. Perhaps if people talked less, animals would talk more. People are incessant talkers. I can give you my word on that. Well... I feel better about Fern, said Mrs. Arable. You don't think I need to worry about her? Does she look well? asked the doctor. Oh, yes. Appetite good? Oh, yes, she's always hungry. Sleep well at night? Oh, yes. Then don't worry, said the doctor. Do you think she'll ever start thinking about something besides pigs and sheep and geese and spiders? How old is Fern? She's eight. Well, said Dr. Dorian, I think she will always love animals, but I doubt she spends her entire life in Homer Zuckerman's barn cellar. How about boys? Does she know any boys? She knows Henry Fussy, said Mrs. Arable brightly. Dr. Dorian closed his eyes and went into deep thought. Henry Fussy, he mumbled. Hmm, remarkable. Well, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Let Fern associate with her friends in the barn if she wants to. I would say, offhand, that spiders and pigs were fully as interesting as Henry Fussy. Yet I predict the day will come when even Henry will drop some chance remark that catches Fern's attention. It's amazing how children change from year to year. How's Avery? he asked, opening his eyes wide. Oh, Avery, chuckled Mrs. Arable. Avery's always fine. Of course, he gets into poison ivy and gets stung by wasps and bees and brings frogs and snakes home and breaks everything he lays his hands on. He's fine. Good, said the doctor. 
Mrs. Arable said goodbye and thanked Dr. Dorian very much for his advice. She felt greatly relieved. That's the end of chapter 14. All right, so what we covered in that chapter was um, sh Fern was telling her mom about the stories that Charlotte was telling them in the barn. And her mom's really worried at this point, so goes and talks to Dr. Dorian. And it's very interesting what Dr. Dorian says, isn't it? He kind of says, well, I haven't heard animals talk, but that doesn't mean that they don't. Perhaps I wasn't listening well enough. He said, if people talked less, animals would talk more. People are incessant talkers. And he said, like, if Fern's, like, eating and sleeping and all those things fine, then she's okay. And he basically said she'll probably love animals her whole life, but she's a kid and soon boys and other kids will catch her attention and she'll spend more time doing kind of like bigger kid things than staying in the barn all the time. And her mom is feeling better. So that's what happened in chapter 14. Now I know one thing that your paper is going to ask you that you're going to work on now after this is it's going to ask you if you agree with Dr. Dorian about what he told Fern's mom. Do you think maybe animals talk and maybe we just talk too much and don't listen closely enough to hear them? I don't know. You'll have to write about what you think. Thank you for reading with me today. I'll see you soon. Have a good day. Bye-bye.